for the masses. It is available on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Periscope, and LinkedIn. So we don't know what platform you're watching from, but um, we're broadcasting on multiple platforms simultaneously. And this is live surgery. There's no editing content. You're getting to come into the operating room for an experience of a lifetime. We're the only spine center in the world that broadcasts live spine surgeries, and we've been doing it now for eight years. Every surgery that we've done, and we've done over a thousand surgeries, um, and we broadcast them all. So we've already completed a cervical spine surgery this morning. It was a Duke laser disc repair for a patient who travels from Germany, and he had the C3-4, C5-6, C6-7 disc herniations and degenerative discs that he had repaired with the laser. That was our first surgery. It went successfully. He's already gone home. This is outpatient surgery, by the way, in case you didn't know. All of our surgeries are, even our fusions are outpatient. This next patient comes to us from Ohio down to Florida. We're in the Space Coast of Florida near Orlando. She came to, from Ohio because she has two herniated discs at C4-5 and C5-6. She has right arm symptoms of weakness, numbness, tingling. Primarily, she has neck pain and headaches. So we're gonna treat those two herniated discs endoscopically. We're gonna do it all with a four millimeter incision. We're not gonna open her neck like traditional surgery is done. Why don't you show our audience um, why disc herniations cause neck pain? Do you mind running that animation for us, Diego? The inflamed annular tear causes neck pain. Inflammation of the nerve roots causes arm pain. A band-aid sized skin incision is made. A small tube is inserted without damaging the bone or soft tissues. The laser removes the herniation and debrides the annular tear. The annular tear heals on its own. It can take up to 12 months. If you have a herniated or bulging disc and neck pain, submit your MRI for a free review at www.mri.dukespot.com. All right, Dr. Duke here. We're getting ready to get started. Sean, we have a x-ray view of the spine. And Sean, we are currently aiming for two, three, four, five, six. Um, hold on. Sean, give me an AP quick. So I'm using my fingers to palpate the spine. I've pushed the carotid artery aside. Perfect lateral, lateral, lateral. And uh, I'm about to enter the C5-6 disc, which is the bottom of the two. I'm in the midline on the AP view, which is the anterior posterior view. Shot. Perfect. All right. Shot. Okay, good. So if we count from the number two bone at the top of the spine, two, three, four, five, six. This is a more degenerated disc. We're going to fix this 5-6 disc and the one above it. You agree this is 5-6, Luis? Yes, Everyone agrees? Yes, Jordan, let's get an AP view. So I've got my needle going through her skin. This is the front of her neck. I'm just to the side of the trachea and esophagus. I've just entered the disc space anteriorly through the anterior longitudinal ligament. And I'm going to verify my position is perfect. It is, not back to a lateral. And now I'm going to advance the needle a little bit further. We're going to do a discogram. And then I'm going to put my guide wire in. And we're going to take this needle out, and then we're going to bring our make an incision and bring our dilator down. So this is the most advanced spine surgery in the world available for herniated disc, degenerated disc, bulging disc in the neck or the back or the thoracic. Okay, shot. And why do we do this surgery? Because it's the best for the patients. Um, there's no scar. There's a tiny, tiny little incision. And instead of putting a metal plate or a cage, 
which makes the insurance makes the uh, implant companies like the Medtronics and the Depews and uh, Nuvasives and Alphatex, they make a lot of money on selling metal and cages that go into people and artificial discs. We're not putting anything in her. We're gonna repair her disc. So this is a more advanced surgery than anything else being done around the world for a herniated disc. We're gonna do our discogram and sh let's see. It's a pretty scarred up disc. You can see I didn't get a lot of dye in but it's actually leaking out through a tear in the back of the disc. Can you point that tear out for our audience? Let's see if I just did a little bit more. Yeah, there's the tear there. Okay, so the black dye, oh, look at that. The dye's already gone. Let's try this again. Oh, try it now. Let's see what we got. There we go. So, huh? yeah, it's pushing back in. So the dye right there where the arrow is, you see the arrow, Diego? That arrow is yes. pointing to the tear in the back of the disc, right in front of the spinal cord and nerve roots. So we've done our discogram. Uh, we didn't get a lot of dye in, and this is not an evocative. We're not looking to see if the patient has pain like we do in the lumbar or thoracic because the patient's asleep. This patient is asleep. They're intubated. They have a tube going in their mouth, and you can see that on the x-ray. The tube is down into their lungs. It's called an endotracheal tube and that tube is keeping them alive. Because right now she's paralyzed chemically from the medicine we gave her, and it's gonna wear off. And we want her, I know it sounds terrible, but it's called chemically paralyzed. We want her chemically paralyzed so that I can feel my fingers to the spine. Otherwise, if the muscles were not chemically paralyzed shot, then she would be gagging on my finger um, and I wouldn't be able to feel the spine. And that's unfortunately what happens uh, in Asia when they do these surgeries with the patients awake. I do not do these surgeries with the patients awake. It's not safe for them to be awake while they're having the surgery because they move around. Um, they sedate these patients. But when you're sedated, you're really not aware of what's going on around you. You're not thinking consciously and you just start flailing your arms, moving your neck. And in Asia, in Korea where they started doing these procedures first, um, the patients were starting to get paralyzed because they were moving around while the doctor had the scalpel in right above their spinal cord or the tube and they would just slice through the spinal cord accidentally. So we have our patient not moving, they're chemically paralyzed, they're intubated under general anesthesia with volatile anesthetic and a, and a muscle relaxer that allows me to touch the spine without um, any resistance to the, from the muscles in the throat, but also to do the surgery safely without the patient moving around. All right, you can see this is the front of the neck. This is the Adam's apple. Her chin is here, her chest bone here, her breasts are here, her body is down here, and we're on the left side of the neck and we're gonna make our incision. Now the incision for the surgery is a four millimeter incision. We're using a number 11 blade. I start right where the, um, guide wire goes into the skin and I make a four millimeter incision. I do not go deep. You don't wanna go deep. Why don't I go deep? Because just deep to the platysma or even on the surface of it, there's veins sometimes called the external jugular vein. And that vein can be quite big and it will bleed if you get it with the scalpel. So rather than nailing the vein, with a scalpel, I'm gonna go down with the dilator. Oh, by the way, let me show you the dilator. Look how skinny this thing is. It's got a tapered tip, it's got a hole, and it runs the guide wire right through the center. Now I bring this down, and I actually twist it a little bit as I go down, and that kind of wiggles the tip around, and it, instead of cutting muscles and tissues, it spreads them apart, okay? Literally spreads them apart, and just like that, and then when I come out, they go back together. So there's no damage done whatsoever. The only damage done here in this whole surgery is the skin, that four millimeter incision. And that's far less than a fusion surgery. All right, you can see the dilator is going in now. And I'm gonna gently, thank you, Luis, that's good. I'm gonna bring it down, twisting it past the trachea shot. Now with the esophagus, which is behind the trachea, I'm going again, twisting it past the esophagus. I feel it passing, shot. And I wanna make sure that the guide wire tip doesn't go further because it'll hit the spinal cord. We don't want that shot. So we're past the esophagus now. We are at the front of the spine. Amazing, isn't it? Bloodless, 
incisionless almost, just a tiny four millimeter incision. The whole surgery, two discs will be fixed through that incision. For those of you thinking about anterior cervical discectomy infusion, laminectomy infusion, laminectomy, foramenotomy, artificial disc, this surgery blows them out of the water. Literally, it's so advanced, it leaves those guys in the dust. Um, all right, AP. How many of these endoscopic spine surgeries have I performed personally at Duke Spine? You, about 1,350 now uh, and counting. Is that a lot? It is for cervical and thoracic since I'm the first in the world to do thoracic endoscopic transfer imminal surgery. Now there is a couple of surgeons in the world that do endoscopic transthoracic surgery for the thoracic spine, but I'm the first to do endoscopic transforaminal thoracic surgery. And that means going through the foramen in the back. It's much safer than going through the chest cavity and moving the heart and lungs over. All right, so if you have a thoracic disc herniation, look up Duke Spine Institute and check out on YouTube our thoracic Duke laser disc repair, spelled D-E-U-K, laser disc repair. You could also go to our app, it's free and download it shot. And by using the app, you'll be able to gain access to all of our videos. Look at the herniation in the back. See it outlined at the back of the disc? It looks like a, well, let's just say a mammillary body. That's safe shot since that is a medical term you know the the kind of doctors that originally named everything in medicine well they were pathologists and they would sit around and and name things and so the things they liked to name were based on food and they were based on um, well you can imagine mammillary, what it means. Um, it has its derivation in breasts. And so there's lots of things that are called mammillary in the human body anatomically, which I didn't name, by the way. So please don't write me any hate mail. But um, other doctors named. And uh, for whatever reason, All right, um, there you go. The things that the pathologists like to name after were foods mostly, like cheeses and wine. That's why you have port wine nevis, uh, all kinds of wine stains, and, um, and then you have lots of cheese, things named after cheese that are conditions. Okay, so we've got our dilator in, and now I'm gonna bring this tube down. So folks, take a look at this. ACDF is a surgery where you make a big cut on the neck, either this way or this way, and you have to move everything over. Tremendous damage is done. And Diego, we run the ACDF versus Duke Laser Disc Repair video for our audience so they could see the difference between what we're doing right now, endoscopic surgery, versus fusion. Will you run that video? Yes. Let me know when it's done. Okay. I'm going to keep going. I hit my elbow. You got to keep it out of my elbow. My elbow moves through here. This whole area is my elbow.
All right, so we've slid down the tube that we're doing the surgery through called the endoscopic tube. And Luis and I are working on getting this dilator out because we slid the tube down the dilator. Shot, let's see where we are. Let's see where we are. Did you get it? All right, just give us a second and we'll answer questions in a minute. Wait, 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 wait. don't pull the tube out. Let's see where we are. All right, there's something I may be able to do to help you. I'm gonna advance the dilator just another millimeter and see if that'll help. Shot, yeah, a little more, shot, all right. And now let's try once again to see if we can get this dilator out of the tube, go. So give us a second to work on this. This is kind of a delicate moment and then I'll come back to answering any questions, but yeah, see it works good, yeah. So what happened was as I, <clears throat> as I brought the tube down over the dilator, Okay, the dilator, can you guys see this? The dilator was inside the disc. I brought the tube down over the dilator and there's a little bit of disc material that got pinched between the end of the dilator and the end of the tube. And that kind of, we call it cold welding something together, but basically they became one unit. And then we had to, I ended up hitting this in just a little bit further. It kind of separated the juicy disc material and released the cold weld. And then we were able to take this out and we're left with our tube. So the whole surgery is gonna be done with this tube and it's a four millimeter wide tube. So look at that incision there, isn't that incredible? We're gonna repair two herniated discs without taking the discs out, without doing a big incision, without creating like a nuclear bomb goes off in the, the tissues and underneath the skin. What you all see with the fusion is an incision. You're like, wow, that incision's pretty cool. Everything must've gone well. What you don't know what happened was inside. And I can tell you right now, surgeons, I've seen them do this. Their technique is terrible. They rip the muscles to shreds. They bleed, cause bleeding everywhere. And all that ripping a muscle and bleeding causes scar tissue. And then people have trouble swallowing after the surgery because they damage the esophagus and the trachea. And you can't see any of that because it's inside your, your neck. But this is a very high priced real estate area for the patient. And that's why people wake up, they have trouble swallowing. They have trouble breathing. They have pain with swallowing. Uh, they have hoarseness because of all the internal damage done by the surgeon during an artificial disc or during a fusion. So the only reason I'm mentioning these things is because it's impossible to do an artificial disc or a cervical fusion through the front without having all that trauma and damage to the soft tissues under the skin. You, the patient, are not aware of it because you can't see it. And they never show you their surgeries they never show you their videos. They never record it because if they did, you would absolutely freak out if you saw what was done. So we just showed you uh, an, an ACDF and that was my ACDF, okay? I did it and I have the most perfect technique there is. I'm not trying to brag on myself, but I'm just telling you what you see with my technique is as, is as Duke good laser as it disc gets. Repair. It's virtually a bloodless. With traditional I respect spinal the fusion planes, surgery. I respect the muscles and tissues. A so patient with that's like, an ACDF done at 100 out of 100. Most surgeons do it at about 45 to 50 or 60 out of 100. So there's a lot of bleeding and damage going on in there. They're never gonna show you their surgeries. I show you all my surgeries because I want you, to, you the viewer, to see the truth. How much blood have we lost? Zero. This has been a bloodless surgery and it probably will be bloodless surgery, okay? All right, how's it going? All right, so we got our tubular retractor through the skin, past the esophagus, trachea, carotid, all the vital structures through the disc. And now the tip of it's at the back of the disc where the herniation is. And I'm gonna literally go in there and just take the herniation out and clean up the annular tear. And we're gonna leave the rest of our patient's body alone and undamaged. And that's why this surgery is so much better than any other surgery, whether it's a fusion or an artificial disc. We will cure this patient's pain. You can use that today. Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna reach in and see if I can grab out any pieces of herniation in the back. Luis, how many of these do we have? Uh, we have like four. We should probably get a few more. Yes, sir. Okay, just while you can. Do you remember where to get them? Well, that's Richard Wolf, right? I don't think Richard Wolf makes that, no. 
It is? Yes. No, that's the other one, but not this. Uh, this is Claris. You got to know your equipment, man. That's a Claris grabber. You need to contact Claris. And I would, if, if, you know, I don't know how Claris is doing as a company, but we need to make sure we get plenty of those. Those are expensive. I know that. All right. Will you do that? Contact them. Will you make a note to remind Luis to contact Claris? Let's just get like at least four more. You know, some of these companies, you never know how long they're going to be around. And that one in particular is special. I've been using it now 15 years. All right, what questions do you have from our audience? Okay, our first question comes from Facebook. Can yes. people get hemorrhosis in the spine? And if so, how is it treat treated? Can people get what? Hemorrhosis? Uh, hemorrhosis. Can you spell it for me? H-E-M-A-T-H-R-O-S-I-S. I don't think that's a correct spelling of a word. Mm -hmm. uh, so here's the problem. I'm not sure what you're talking about. I don't know if they're asking, can you get like hamartomas of the spine? Hamartomas are spelled H-A-M-A-R-T-O-M-A, -A -A, but I don't know if that's what they're asking. So I really don't know the question. I apologize. Uh, hemarthrosis, it means bleeding into the joints. Oh, hemarthrosis. Hemarthrosis, okay. Hemarthrosis is H-E-M-E-A-R-T-H-R-O-S-I-S. Hemarthrosis. Arthrosis is a joint, heme is blood. Hemarthrosis. All right, so the question is, can they get hemarthrosis of the spine? Yes, that's the question. Not really. I mean, you may get some hemarthrosis in like a facet joint, but in general, it just doesn't happen. So... I've never seen it in 26 years. I don't think that's a real uh, legitimate <clears throat> kind of diagnosis or concern. Now, I could be wrong. I would be the first person to admit it if I'm wrong. Okay, I have no problem admitting I'm wrong at times. I don't know everything, but um, I've never heard of that. I'm not sure why you would have hemarthrosis. I kind of feel like it's a diagnosis that was maybe told to you by someone trying to cover up a mistake in treatment. But I could be wrong about that too. You wouldn't believe the kind of stories that people are told by their doctors trying to hide and conceal the truth. There are so many things that doctors do that cause problems for patients. And then they cover it up most of the time by telling the patient some nonsense story. The biggest thing I see, honestly, is surgeons blaming their failed surgery on um, scar tissue. Scar tissue doesn't really cause a failed surgery. It's extremely unusual. Scar tissue can cause your swallowing tube to scar to your metal plate in your neck. And that can definitely cause problems for you, like trouble swallowing. Okay, and that would be due to the scarring of your esophagus posteriorly to the plate, to the front surface of the plate. How's our irrigation, by the way? All right. Just getting a lot of bubbles. So hemarthrosis, which is bleeding into a joint, I've never seen it in a spine, but it sounds to me like some surgeon screwed up with their procedure and they're calling it hemarthrosis to throw the patient off the scent. These are fragments of disc herniation right here. They're small ones, but disc herniations are often made up of a bunch of small fragments. Very common to see that. Uh, we have another question from Facebook. 
Sure. Our patient here has fusion in her cervical spine and is asking if she would be a candidate for herniations in her lumbar spine. She says she's had a few decompression and she's been told that she needs fusion. All right, so the patient that is saying she's got herniated discs in her lumbar spine, she's been told she needs a fusion, I believe, and she wants to know if this surgery would work for her. The answer is yes, this surgery is a much better alternative than fusion. You don't want to have a fusion. Um, there's a 99% chance that we can fix your back problem with your herniated disc with just the laser surgery and no fusion. All right, so I'm at the back of the disc. This is that really degenerated disc we looked at earlier, the number five, six. And there's a lot of arthritis, inflammation, and actually some scar tissue here. Now the scar tissue here in this particular location can actually uh, tear. And when you move your neck, suddenly you can actually feel severe pain in your neck from the scar tissue tearing the scar tissue inside the disc itself, which is what I'm working on. Um, you can see how red and inflamed the end plates are. And this is because this disc was, has been inflamed. And we're just looking at a small area of the disc right now, about a quarter of the disc is in view. We need to get to the rest of it. And I'm gonna do that progressively, slowly and progressively in a methodical manner. Right now I'm zapping away a lot of that inflammatory junk that's piled up as a result of inflammation. Okay. Start moving the other way. Uh, we have a viewer asking if you take Medicare. All right. A viewer asked if what? If you take Medicare. Yes. We take Medicare at Duke Spine for sure. But understand, Medicare is a type of insurance. And like all insurances, they try to get out of paying for your medical care. And uh, so Medicare used to be really good where they would cover just about everything. But now they started cutting back on what they cover. So they may not cover everything we do, don't be surprised, um, but we do take Medicare. They cover many of the things we offer, but not everything. There was a time when Medicare covered everything. Um, they would cover therapy all year as many therapy sessions as you needed. And then they cut back to 45 sessions a year. And then they cut back to 40 and then 30. And now they're down to like, I don't know, 15 or something. People with Medicare could tell you, I don't have Medicare, I'm not that old yet. But Medicare has stopped covering so much. As a matter of fact, the anesthesiologists, they take about 200 bucks an hour on average, let's just say, Medicare pays them $90 an hour. So where does the rest of the money come from? Well, you guessed it, <laughs> you, um, the patient. So what they're doing is they're transferring that financial res responsibility to you. Even though you've paid for Medicare your whole life by working and paying taxes to the United States government, they should be covering everything. But guess what they've done? This is what's happened with Medicare. Since nobody's asking me a question, I'll just go off a little bit. So Medicare is really the federal government. It's a giant bank account, okay? So you pay taxes every year, every paycheck. It's called FICA and FUCA. And it should be spelled a little different than FUCA <laughs> because that's what they're doing. They're fuca you, all right? <laughs> so what they do is they take I forgot, like 4% out of every paycheck. Hey, where's the laser? Come on. Laser. Oh. Sorry. My bad then. 
I think the pedal is squirming around. So Medicare takes your taxes every paycheck, like 4%, and they tuck it away into a bank account and they pay for people that have Medicare's in medical bills, okay? And this happened about 30 years ago where Medicare was paying and paying and then um, Blue Cross Blue Shield went up to them and they said, hey, listen, uh, how much are you spending a year? Oh, we're spending uh, $800 billion a year. Well, what if we were to manage your benefits for the Medicare patients? Well, what do you mean by that? Well, what if we, Blue Cross, come in and, and we kind of oversee the payment of bills and we get the power, you give us the power to deny payment and deny treatments for Medicare patients. Um, and we'll become what's called the Medicare Administrator, the, M the MAC, M-A-C. And Medicare said, well, that sounds okay, but how do we know you're gonna do a better job? And the Blue Cross Blue Shield said, we guarantee we'll do a better job. We'll save you at least 30%, maybe 40 or 50% over time. So Medicare said, okay, if you can guarantee that, what are you gonna get in return? And they said, well, we want 20 cents on every dollar we save you. So Medicare agreed to this. They basically signed a deal with the devil giving the Blue Cross in Florida, Puerto Rico, California, I think, I'm not sure who has Texas, but they carved up the Medicare patients in the United States and some areas they gave to United Healthcare, some areas they gave to Medicare, I mean uh, to Blue Cross, sorry. Some areas they gave to Cigna. Now of course they don't call themselves Cigna and Blue Cross, they call themselves things like First Coast Services, they have some really interesting names. But in the end, it's basically a private insurance company in charge of paying for your medical bills and coverage, and they're denying those treatments, reducing what Medicare is spending, and in exchange, they're getting, I think it's about 20% of every dollar they're saving Medicare. So the way they're saving Medicare is not by improving the quality of care, they're just denying, and they're taking the blame for it, okay? And meanwhile, patients are the ones getting screwed out of their benefits that they've been paying for, and the insurance companies are making profit on every dollar they save Medicare from paying, even though it could be medically necessary. That's the scam that's going on right now with Medicare and the Medicare administrators. Look it up. And they hide this from you, the public. They don't want the public to know the truth. They don't want you to know that, for example, in Florida, First Coast Services which is the Medicare administrator, is Blue Cross Blue Shield. And all they do basically is deny. Deny, deny payments, deny authorizations, deny treatment. And they're making it harder and harder for people with Medicare to get the, the coverage. So I'll give you an example. You used to get unlimited physical therapy. And now you only get like 16 days a year, okay, covered. The rest of the days, it doesn't matter if your therapist says you still need therapy and it doesn't matter if you're getting better with therapy. They're not gonna pay for it because they've capped it out. So now, of course, Blue Cross is saving Medicare money and they're getting a kickback from Medicare for doing that. Meanwhile, you, the patients, are the ones stuck with the bill. So if you think that's okay, well then just keep letting things go the way they are. You know, I'm preparing for my Medicare years is I don't trust the Medicare system at all. And I'm saving my money for my medical bills that I'm gonna have when I'm a Medicare age patient. There's a herniation, you know? You can't trust your government to take care of you because they won't. They'll, they'll offer you insurance, Medicare, but they don't cover, it won't cover anything then. Do you know that for the first time in the history of Medicare, Medicare is requiring prior authorization for surgery. They've never done that before, but they are now. Guess what surgery they're requiring prior authorization for? The first surgery in the history of Medicare that Medicare is requiring prior authorization for. And when I say Medicare, of course, it's the insurance companies that are behind this. Okay, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Cigna, United Healthcare, because they're the ones benefiting from the denials, financially benefiting. They are requiring prior authorization for anterior cervical discectomy infusion. 
exactly what this patient would be having, having had she not run into the Duke Spine Institute and learned about the laser surgery we do, okay? So basically, spine surgery is being the target of um, the insurance companies and Medicare to save money by rationing care. Now, if you want to do an ACDF on a Medicare patient, the surgeon has to apply for permission, authorization to do it, okay? Some of you may say, good, but no, it's not good because what if I had a meal plan and you pay me for a meal plan, but I get to decide if you eat or not, okay? So you pay me $30 a day and I let you into the cafeteria to eat when I think you're hungry. <laughs> think about that. That's what's happening. You're paying an insurance company money as part of a plan for insurance and they're deciding whether or not you need it, the medical treatment. The same people that profit off of keeping your money and not paying bills. That's crazy, and people are, are oblivious to this, and I have to figure this stuff out and teach you guys. Shame on you. You should do your own research and figure out why your medical benefits have been cut. But it's not for your good, I promise you that. Underpaying providers, underpaying and denying treatments that are standard and good and not experimental, those underpayments and denials are hurting people. And until you all wake up and smell the coffee and start working together, going to your politicians and lobbying for them to actually write laws that keep the insurance companies from denying your medical care that you need as determined by you and your doctor together, not the insurance company telling you if you need it or not. Until that day comes, you're going to continue to be uh, guinea, not guinea pigs, but you know, basically taken advantage of, okay? So I'm sorry it's happening. I didn't do it, but I learned about it because I'm, I'm always trying to do what's best for my patients and I'm actually pretty damn good at what I do in spine. And when the insurance companies tell me, oh, that surgery is experimental, no, it's not. ACDF has never been experimental. We've been doing it now for 70 years and now you're telling me it's experimental? Who the hell are you to tell me what I do, what I've trained to decide what's right and wrong for my patients as a neurosurgeon? How can you, an insurance company, suddenly tell me what I'm doing is wrong? And obviously motivated to save the money. Uh, so people wake up, smell the coffee, unite, go march, and get your state senators and congressmen to do what they're supposed to do, which is to look after your best interest, not the insurance companies. Scope off. Scope off on, All right, that's one bad disc fixed. And got another one to go. Mm -hmm. Irrigation. A little antiseptic. Uh, the woman who asked that question says, thank you. She appreci appreciates your honesty. It's a rarity in this field. Thanks. Yeah, you know, my job here with you all is to teach you the truth. I don't benefit in any way from teaching you the truth. You do. I think uh, it's criminal what's happening with the insurance companies. They're getting away with stealing everyone's health and money, both and it's not right. I don't mind someone stealing something from me as long as they tell me they're going to steal something and tr not try to cover it up and tell me they're trying to help me when they're really stealing from me. It's the dishonesty part. I could deal with the theft because I would just stop it once I know they're stealing. But when they lie to me and tell me they're there to help me, hey, we're going to give you life insurance policy. When you die, it'll help your family. And then you pay for it, and then you're, uh, you die, and then they don't give money to your family. That's dishonest. So I, uh, I don't like the dishonesty. And that's the thing I can help you all understand is how they're cheating you. 
Okay. Let's get the fluoroscope in. We've done one disc repair. We're going to do the next. We're not going to make another incision. We're going to use the same incision. That incision is four millimeters. It's tiny. We've lost zero blood. This is a bloodless surgery to fix these disc herniations. Okay, bloodless. So you don't, if you have a heart condition, you have problems with bleeding, you don't need to worry. We do need you off your blood thinners. But um, in general, this surgery, we don't really lose any blood. All right, that looks pretty good. Let's go a little farther forward, just a tiny bit. So you can see we are at the two, three, four, five, six disc. You can see that that disc um, was pretty collapsed and degenerated. People always ask me, well, there's a bone spur. Are you gonna take the bone spurs out? No, you don't need the bone spurs taken out. The bone spurs aren't the problem. 99% of the time, the bone spurs are not the problem. It's the herniation and it's the tear in the annulus that's the problem. I leave bone spurs all the time and people have no symptoms from them at all. Shot. All right, so I'm taking this tube out and I'm gonna give it to Luis and I'm gonna, let me have a ray tech. Look at that beautifulness. Four millimeter incision, tube is there. I mean, the dilator is there, tube's out. And now I'm gonna move this thing. I'm literally gonna march it up the spine. Not yet, give me a minute. And I'm gonna move it up to the next disc. So we're doing four, five and five, six, correct? Everybody? So we've done five, six, we gotta go up a disc. We all agree. Sometimes I talk about these things and they seem silly, but they, we do this because I've never had a wrong site surgery or a wrong level surgery. Now, when it comes to doing surgery, orthopedics, neurosurgery, doc, surgeons make mistakes all the time and they operate on the wrong body part or they operate on the wrong disc, but I've never done that. And, I, and I'm, I've never done it because I'm very careful myself, but I also involve my team so that I get their opinion as well, you know, to make sure. They may look at me funny and smirk at me, which I don't think they do, but at least this way we're all like hearing it, thinking about it, and we get all these people involved and keep them involved so that we're all working towards the same goal, which is fixing the right level. All right, so <clears throat> I'm gonna move this thing out of here and move it up a level. Okay, I'm gonna do that by using the x-ray. Zero blood. All right, I can't really see that well. All right, that's good. You guys ready? Here we go, shot just about out and it's a feel thing you got to feel it there it is I felt it shot so I'm outside the disc sitting on the ALL give me an AP I want to make sure I didn't go to the right or left side so I'm gonna hold this thing against the spine and make sure I'm in the middle of the spine you want to be just between the longest coli muscles so I'm a little bit off to her right. I'm gonna move it back to the left, shot, and that's perfect, I'm dead center. All right, now go back to a lateral view. So I've corrected my side to side with the AP view. Now I'm gonna move this thing up the spine to the next disc. Can you give me inline traction, slight extension, please? So I'm gonna have my anesthesiologist hold the head in slight extension. No, no, are you extending? Please extend, push the occiput towards the feet. Yeah, that's good, right there. Shot, is that it? All right, now I'm gonna march my way up to the next level, shot. Okay, give me an AP, let's just make sure I'm in the center. So the longest coli muscles run on the front of the spine, okay? And if you go through them, if you accidentally go through the longest coli muscles, you have two problems, well, three. Number one, you're no longer in the middle where you need to be because when you enter the disc in the front in the middle, you can sweep like a, a windshield wiper side to side in the back of the disc. But if you go onto the side, you're gonna have trouble doing that. Mallet, come on, come on. Do you feel that in the head? Shot. All right, let me just get one more AP to verify I'm still in the middle. I haven't moved or slipped. 
Almost done, doctor. Just give me a minute. I want to make sure I'm still in the middle of the spine, not to the side. All right, we're still in the middle. Back to a, a lateral view. All right. And I'm going to advance this now. I'm through the anterior longitudinal ligament. So what are the, the three reasons you don't want to go off to the side and go through the longus coli? Okay, number one, this disc is firm. Anybody know? Shot. Anybody know the reasons? We already said one. You're going to be off to the side. You're not going to go straight back to the back of the disc. You'll be favoring one side, which is bad. Number two, pipe cleaner. Number two is when you go through the longus coli muscle, it's going to bleed. It's going to bleed, all right? Muscles have tremendous blood supply, and if you tear through it, you're going to bleed it, and you're going to get bleeding. We don't want that. Bleeding is bad. It leads to several bad things. Number one, loss of blood. We call it anemia. Anemia is not good for the patient to heal. Can you wipe that fuzz off? Number two, bleeding internally causes scar tissue. Most people don't know that. Shot? All right, here we go. Discogram time. Shot? There it is. You can see the tear in the back of the disc. Shot one more time. Let's go. Shot. Is that it? All right, good. All right, so now we've done our discogram. No, 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 no. I need to bring the dilator back. All right. So number number one, anemia problem. Number two, scar tissue from the blood. Okay. And number three, bleeding always reduces visibility. Okay. You know those times you're watching me do endoscopic surgery and it's hard to see what I'm doing? It's because of blood. So bleeding causes anemia, which is low blood, red blood cells, which affects healing of the wound and the, and the disc. Number two, it obscures my visual field, so it's hard for me to see as a surgeon what I'm doing. And number three, it causes scar tissue. So you don't want bleeding with surgery. Minimize, that's it, okay? The other reason you don't want to go through the longus coli muscles, the third reason is what? This is a high level answer. You have to be a neurosurgeon or you have to work for me. Luis, yes. why? Oh God, <laughs> what was the question? Are you thinking about chimichangas or something? Yes. Huh? That's what I'm thinking about. Um, the longus coli muscles have something in them. Let's see if Diego knows. The no? colon muscles? Nah, longus no clue. Coli. No clue. It's a nerve, a nerve structure that runs through the longus coli muscles. I've talked about it before. Yes, the one that causes Horner syndrome. What, what is it? It's a sympathetic trunk. It's a bundle of nerves, shot. And look up Horner syndrome. If you damage it, the patient gets Horner syndrome. And that does, that's not horny syndrome where they get horny all the time. It's Horner's syndrome. You get a pupillary abnormality. You get facial flushing and ptosis. Okay? So it's permanent. You don't want that. And it's not good. So we don't want that. All right? We don't want a Horner's. It looks like we're trapped again. Oh. Are you getting the, the fluoro on this? Relax for a second. So the answer was the sympathetic trunk is inside the longus coli muscle. We don't want to damage it. So you want to stay out of the longus coli muscle for a lot of reasons. The most important reason is the damage to the sympathetic trunk. The second most important reason is the bleeding. And the third is you don't want to be off to the side of the spine when you go back through the disc. Otherwise, it's going to restrict your ability to fix the whole disc. 
Okay? So if you're going to do these procedures, don't do them at home. Don't do them on your sibling. And don't do them without proper training. Yes, we make it look easy, but it's not really that easy. If it was easy, everyone would be doing this. All right. Are you tricking me here? I got it. I just had trouble attaching the fluid adapter. Any questions from our audience, Diego? Yes, point? yes, we have a few questions. Uh, we have a patient that looks like she's from London, England, said if the surgery is available in London. No, Hi, no, it's London. only in Melbourne, Florida. But she's asking how long will she have to stay in Florida for the surgery and our follow-ups via Zoom. How long does she need to stay? Yeah. So first of all, we have an international um, person watching and they're asking us is this surgery available in london england the answer is no it's not but we have a lot of patients from england that come here and get this surgery done because it's not available anywhere in europe it's not available anywhere in europe it's available here in our, the space coast of the united states basically in florida near orlando uh, we're 40 minutes from the airport in orlando that's where you have to come as far as follow-up goes, believe it or not, there's no follow-up. We see you the next morning, and we've never had a complication or problem, and patients go home literally the next day in the evening or the following day, okay? So how long do you need to be here? You fly in on went Sunday, we do the office visit on Monday, do the paperwork, and then Tuesday is your surgery, Wednesday your follow-up appointment, and you can go back Wednesday evening, back to London. So it's really a three-day process. It doesn't matter where you come from. You just need to be here three days. Can you stay longer? Of course. We would love for you to stay longer. Can you come back to the office as many times as you want? Absolutely, but there's no need to. Uh, and we do Zoom calls. As a matter of fact, if you'd like for us to look at your MRI and tell you our opinion, all you have to do is go to our free MRI review. Diego, will you put the link for the free MRI review for Duke Spine and just give us your MRI, either upload the images off your CD, you can do that on our website link. You'll need a CD reader for your computer, you pop the CD in the CD reader and you transfer the files from the CD directly onto our website, okay? And if you do that, you will, um, be able to transfer all those files over, okay? And then we will have them, and we will look at them. It's a little blurry. Hmm. Seems like I have to have the scope in a certain position. I'm wondering if the glue is not leaving the fibers. Luis? Yes, sir. By the way, this is the herniation I'm working on, in case you weren't aware. It's herniated outside the uh, disc, and I'm cleaning it up. That down there is probably posterior ligament. The fibers run up and down for posterior ligament. These are all pieces of herniation. So I'm just kind of floating them out of the tube, and then I'm going back in. Uh, we have another question from YouTube. Well, let me finish answering our, our British patient. Um, so the answer is we, we take lots and lots of people from other, there's another herniation fragment right there. Uh, lots and lots of people from out of the country, 60% to 70% of our patients are from out of, uh, out of the state. And the reason is because nowhere else in the world can you get this surgery, nowhere. Um, so people have to come here to Duke Spine here in, in Florida. The other answers was, what's the follow-up procedure like? You come the next day and visit us. You're welcome to come as many times as you want, but you really don't need to. But just the next day, we want to see you in the morning. Um, you spend the night in the hotel, obviously, after the surgery. And by the way, you're up walking. It's an hour recovery. One hour, and you're up walking. You're driving If you the next day. You're... Um, walking on the beach that same day. Really, it's uh, the very, very quick recovery. And we do Zoom calls, so if you ever want to follow up, you can. Um, our patients generally don't because they're doing fantastic. They have no problems. 
They don't need any follow-up. Now, about 20% of our patients have other aches and pains. There's the herniation, right, by the way, right there in the foramen, right against the nerve root. So some of our patients have aches and pains they get from um, starting to get more active, so their muscles start working more, and they start getting some muscle aches, uh, which take about you know a few months to recover from the muscles. Because the muscles, we don't damage any muscles in surgery, but a lot of people who are in pain, the chronic pain, they haven't been really exercising, they haven't been doing much. So their muscles are, for lack of a better word, we call it atrophy or deconditioning. It's kind of like being a, an athlete and being out of shape because you haven't done anything. Like literally just stayed on a couch for a long time. So you're, you're not gonna be able to run fast or do things um, like you used to until you recondition your muscles. So the recovery can be uh, a long time, not from the surgery, but from the deconditioning of the muscles, if that makes sense. It has nothing to do with my surgery, it has to do with how long your body takes to heal, okay? And, and get your strength back, not from the surgery once again, but from, from uh, just being inactive and not being very athletic and not um, doing things. That's our hole, by the way, in the posterior ligament where the herniation is squeezed out. And I still have some little chunks in here. Don't pop the bag, whatever you do. All right. So I'm going to come back to that side again. All right, what was the other question? Uh, yes, we have a comment from YouTube. Um, this guy has C3 to, s to 6 fused, but was refused an implant. Wants to know why that happens. Uh, C3 to C6 are fused? Yes. And he didn't get it fused surgically? Uh, no. He's I assume, right? Because I he's assume. asking why did it happen. Yeah, he got refused yeah. an implant. Infused what? He got refused an implant. Diego, one thing you do that you got to fix is you trail off with your voice. Keep your voice present throughout the entire sentence until you're done. Okay. I can't really hear you. An implant. He wanted an implant but got refused. Uh, I know. You heard him, but I can't. And he's, he's trailing off is why. Sorry, Diego. I'm going to have to ask you to repeat it one okay. more time. Okay. So he got fused from C3 to C6. Yeah. But he wanted an implant. He got refused that. Oh, you're saying he's not fused, but he... He, he is being fused from C3 to C6. Yeah. He wanted an implant, but got refused. Like, refused. Like, they didn't give him the implant. Oh, so they're fusing him without implants? Yes. Yeah, you're not going to fuse. Okay. Yeah. No, the problem is to fuse a spine, you have to stop the movement. The purpose of the implants is to stop the movement. Okay? If they don't give you an implant and they try to fuse you with just bone, the failure rate on that is 80%. Hey, I'm not getting any flow here. Okay? For whatever reason, I'm not getting enough flow. There's just some stagnation. That's better. So if you're talking about, th there's a lot of hokey pokey going on. And what I'm hearing from this person is that they, they want surgery. There's, what? This person has, sounds like three, four, four, five, five, six, three disc herniations. They're being recommended for surgery, a fusion but somehow either their insurance or their surgeon, or I don't know who, is refusing to give him the metal implants he needs for the fusion. That's a bad scenario. I would not go through with that surgery because you're not gonna fuse if that's the case. You're, they're gonna put bone graft in there. Oh, look at that herniation coming out of the frame and that's awesome. That was on the patient's right side, their side of their worst symptoms. Luis, I think the scope, um, the fibers are you know, look how blurry it is. I think the fi fibers are, um, the glue between them is separating and their, fi and their focal length is 
shifting as I flex the tube. You know, is this a new, newly repaired? No. Look how blurry it is. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. The problem is I'm putting a lot of force on the tube because I'm having to go out the foramen. And as it flexes, the fibers in the fiber optic sheath, there's 5,000 fiber optic fibers in here. Okay, if they don't line up properly, you're going to get a blurry image. All right. So whoever the person was that asked that question, I'm very concerned for you. Uh, if it's possible, don't get that surgery. Come here and let us repair your discs. There's no implants needed. We don't use implants for the surgery. We don't put anything inside your body that stays. We literally go in inside the disc and we find the part in the back that's damaged and we repair it as you're seeing with a laser. So if it's possible, come to us and we won't need implants. But anyone else that's trying to fuse you, your spine and they're not going to use an implant, I would be very cautious. The failure rate on that kind of surgery is very high, around 80% failure of spinal fusion without implants, especially multi-level. You're not talking about one level, you're talking about multiple levels. Uh, we have another comment also from YouTube. Yeah. Does this surgery work on stenosis? Does this surgery work on stenosis? 100%, yes. This surgery works on stenosis. We're treating a herniated disc that's causing stenosis. So this patient's arm symptoms are from stenosis. Right here, there's stenosis right here. And we just fixed the stenosis. Remember that piece of herniation? Hit rewind and a big piece of blue disc was in here, remember? That was causing stenosis or narrowing. That's why we were here. Now this patient in particular has a lot of neck pain and stenosis doesn't cause neck pain. Herniated discs and your tear cause neck pain. But the stenosis causes arm symptoms and she had uh, right arm symptoms from that herniation in the foramen. Oh man, I'm worried about this scope. I wonder if this is... Yeah, the monitor? Heck no, oh, it's the scope. The question is, is it just the fibers are ungluing or is it something more serious? Because these scopes I've had for years and I don't want the new scopes. I can't stand them. There's a nerve root right there. See that white, whitish thing right there? Right there is the nerve root. That's the nerve root. And this is scar tissue sitting on top of it. Oh, look at that herniation that just came out. Oh. That's the Leviathan. That came right out of that foramen, right past the nerve root. That's the big bad one we've been waiting for. All right. So I feel really good about her right foramen, which is what I've been working on. I'm going to switch to the other side and just clean up the back of the tear, the annular tear where the pain's coming from, causing her neck pain and headaches. And we'll be done. Uh, five minutes. Just. Yes, yeah, so what were the other questions? Uh, no more questions, but we do have a couple people saying that due to their back pains, uh, they haven't been able to live regular lives, that everything that you've been saying is true. Yeah. Um, folks, the greatest news in the world, back pain can be cured now. You just have to go somewhere that they know how to cure it. And there's not a lot of places. I'm very sorry. Someday there will be. But in the year 2021, there's just so many doctors that don't understand the causes of back pain and how to fix them. But they are totally curable. If you can make your way to Duke Spine, we can do it for you. All right. It's just a matter of figuring out what's causing it. That's step one. If you don't have a cause of back pain, like the specific cause, you're not going to figure, you're not going to get it fixed, okay? 
that's herniation right there. I'm glad I stuck around. Just came back and looked and there it is. So they kind of shift around the tube a little bit sometimes. But back pain, most common cause of back pain are herniated disc. Second most common cause of back pain, facet joints, facet joint arthritis. Third most common cause of back pain is like piriformis syndrome or sacroiliitis. And then you get into fractures of the bones. But um, those are all fixable problems with shots and therapy. The disc herniations are fixable with this surgery. This surgery is the only way to fix back pain from a herniated disc unless you want to do fusion. Now, a good, well done artificial disc can also cure back pain. Um, but you have to fix the tear in the back of the disc and a lot of surgeons don't know about that tear. Some get lucky and they fix it while they're doing the fusion or the artificial disc without even knowing they're doing it. They're actually cleaning out that area and they clean out the tear, which is great for the patient because they get better. But consistently getting better with spinal fusion, you can't really consistently say you're always going to get better because the surgeon has to understand the cause of the back pain. And if the surgeon doctor treating you doesn't understand the cause, there's no way they're going to get to the, the source and cure you. That was pretty cool right there, huh? All right. Oh, uh, we have another question from the app. Sure. Uh, if you have a spine stimulator, can you still qualify for this surgery? Yeah, if you have a spinal cord stimulator, can you still qualify for the surgery? Sure, 100%. Spinal cord stimulators don't prevent you from getting fixed the proper way. Um, we have plenty of people with spinal cord stimulators. As a matter of fact, I just saw one uh, in clinic this week, um, yesterday. And she actually has three discs in her back that are herniated. And she needs three discs repaired with laser. And so we're, we submitted for her insurance to cover it. We're waiting to hear back. Uh, but that said, um, if they approve it, then she's going to go forward and get it done. And I'm going to have to work around the spinal cord stimulator because it's on her left side, the same side that I need to go on for the laser. So I'm going to have to move that stimulator to do the laser. It's going to be an interesting one. So keep your eyes posted for that one, a three level lumbar. And once again, she has that stimulator on the left side that's blocking my ability to do the surgery, but I'm going to temporarily move it out of the way, the battery generator and fix her spine. And then hopefully she can get the stimulator out permanently because it's not doing her any good. Uh, we have another question from Facebook. Sure. Uh, can migraines be related to neck pain? Yeah. Can migraines be related to neck pain? So, yes, they can. The typical headaches that people get from a bad disc in their neck are called uh, cervicogenic, cervicogenic headaches spelled C-E-R-V-I-C-O-G-E-N-I-C. -E -E and it just means, genesis means to create, originate. Cervicogenic means a headache from the neck, cervical spine, basically. So a cervicogenic headache is a headache coming from the neck. And um, they're not really migraines, but um, they're cervicogenic headaches. They're actually not truly migraines. The migraines come from vasomotor instability of the blood vessels in the brain, okay? It means the blood vessels open and close and allow blood in. And there are fluctuations of kind of microcirculation. But a migraine can be triggered by neck pain because migraines have triggers. And so there are different triggers for different people. Some people it's wine, some people it's chocolate, some people it's loud noises, some people it's you know, sounds or, or visions, visual things. The point is, people with migraines have different triggers. So could your neck pain be a trigger? 100%. Yeah, you can, for sure. 
So can your headaches get better with surgery? If your neck pain is a trigger, then yes. And if you read my paper I published in 2013, you'll see that um, two thirds of the patients had headaches that had this surgery. Uh, two thirds had headaches before surgery and that we got rid of 95% of the headaches on average, 95%. So that's 95% of the headaches and, and one half of the patients had 100% of their headaches gone. So that's really good with this surgery. Okay, we're done. It's bloodless. We've lost no blood and I just want everyone to see this here. Go ahead and get that out of there. Let's get these cables over. I want you all to see the patient is actually um, laying facing up at your camera that you're looking at, looking through. And basically, can you all see that? This is the, the middle of her neck here. She's facing up, that's the chin, that's the chest. There's the neck and there's the tube. We did the whole surgery through this tiny little tube. Okay, now it's out. I'm just gonna hold pressure for a moment and then you can actually see She's gagging a little bit. You see what I mean by gagging? Can you guys see her movement of her neck? As I'm pushing here, it's natural for the human body a reflex to gag, okay? If you have water that goes down the wrong pipe, you gag. If you have something in the back of your throat, you gag. Well, that something is my fingers pushing on the back of her throat, but I'm doing that to hold pressure because I don't want her doing any bleeding. You can see her gagging right there. You see that? All right, there's the incision. We're gonna close it up. And the su surgery was successful. Let's get her in a collar. Great job, everyone. If you have further questions, feel free to type them up. I'll answer them for you. I'm Dr. R. Duke Majin, CEO and founder, pioneer of the Duke Laser Disc Repair. The inflamed annular tear causes neck pain. Inflammation of the nerve roots causes arm pain. A band-aid sized skin incision is made. A small tube is inserted without damaging the bone or soft tissues. The laser removes the herniation and debrides the annular tear. The annular tear heals on its own. It can take up to 12 months. If you have a herniated or bulging disc and neck pain, submit your MRI for a free review at www.mri.dukespine.com.
you are live. Hi, I'm Dr. Arj Agnajan. It's great to be with you. We've just finished surgery on one of our patients who's traveled from Ohio. Because she has two herniated discs in her neck, she's been troubled with neck pain for a long time. And the pain started to go uh, down into her arm uh, on her right side. And really, most of the problem was the neck pain going up into the head. So we figured out she had two herniated discs, one at C4-5, the other at C5-6. And those herniated discs were causing all of her neck pain. So we went in today and we did endoscopic surgery to repair those two discs. And we did this without taking the discs out completely. We just fixed the part in the back where the pain was coming from. What's the advantage of doing that? Well, number one, you don't have to put metal in the patient's neck when you actually keep their natural disc there. So by leaving her disc there and only fixing the little bit in the back of the disc by passing through the disc, fixing it in the back, she's able to have her normal disc there without an artificial disc made out of metal. She's able to have her normal disc there without having to have a fusion and a cage put in. All right? She doesn't have to have metal put in her neck. So we're able to do the whole surgery through a four millimeter incision, not big. And I fixed both discs with one little incision. Why is that good for the patient? Well, number one, you don't have your neck filleted open. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go back to the beginning of this video and watch, and we'll run it again in a minute. Diego is going to run it for you, and he's going to show you tube laser disc repair versus uh, fusion. And you can see we made a tiny little cut in this patient's neck and put the tube in. Whereas when you're doing a fusion, it's a big incision, a lot of scar tissue, a lot of bleeding, a lot of damage to the, to the tissues under the skin. You can't see that, of course. But the people who have open neck surgery like ACDF or artificial disc, they can feel it for days and weeks after surgery. Things just don't feel right. You get pinching. You get little sharp pains. That's all that scar tissue forming in there. You don't want any of that. That's going to cause problems for you with swallowing and hoarseness for the rest of your life. Okay? Plus, we didn't have to put in any metal, okay? Who is metal good for? Metal's good for the companies that make and sell metal. That's about it. It's good for the surgeons who put it in. They make a lot of money putting it in. But you don't need metal anymore put in your spine, not for your neck, not for your back, not for thoracic. Just look up the Duke Laser Disc Repair. This is endoscopic surgery. Am I a metal surgeon? Sure I was. I was a big metal surgeon. I put more metal in patients than most 99% of spine surgeons. Why? Because when you're a really good spine surgeon, you have great results, people come to you. And so when I was doing metal surgery for the first, you know, I, I still do metal surgery, but when I was really doing a lot of it for like 20 years out of my career, I put in millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of metal. Okay, fusions, artificial discs, rods, screws, cages, plates. And I did it because it worked and patients did fantastic. But... They had to have all that metal in them, and they had to have a long recovery. And people wouldn't go back to work or normal life for months. Then I started doing the laser surgeries that we're doing now, and people go back to normal life in a day or two. And they don't have any metal. They don't have any recovery time. And best of all, there's no opioids or narcotics needed after these surgeries. People don't take narcotics. The painkillers after these surgeries are like Tylenol. Come on in, Amir. We're almost done. So if you're taking Tylenol after spine surgery, hey, that's pretty good. That means there wasn't a lot of damage done inside your body. When you got to dope yourself up with all kinds of pain pills, or narcotics, muscle relaxers, sedatives, uh, what have you, when you have to take all that stuff just to get relief of pain, well, there's a problem going on under your skin you don't see. And your body's talking to you. It's ter terribly traumatic, okay? So open spine surgery, fusions, artificial this. Lay, uh, everything like that is all traumatic surgery. You want to avoid the trauma. You want to treat your body with respect and treat it well and not have to be on painkillers for months after surgery. Okay. You want to do the Duke laser disc repair. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, what questions do we have? Uh, we have somebody that wants you to go over that symptoms of what causes those headaches, those migraines, especially mm -hmm. with neck pain. She wants you to go over it because she messed up. So. All right, no problem. So right now we're running a video that's doing a side-by-side -side showing you uh, fusion versus laser. But that's a lumbar fusion, by the way, you're showing, Diego, not the cervical. We do have the cervical. Yeah. Okay. You've been running the lumbar one? I guess, yeah. Okay. All right. 
Um, so the reason why a uh, herniated disc costs headaches is because there's a covering that goes around your spinal cord and it runs up around your brain. It's white and it's thin. It's about two or three millimeters thick. It's called the dura mater, dura, D-U-R-A. Look it up, dura. Anyway, that dura starts in your neck. It actually goes all the way down to your tailbone. Okay, so it wraps your spinal cord and nerves and your brain. If something is irritating the dura in your neck, it's going to irritate the dura all the way up to the back of your head around your brain. And that is a headache, folks. So irritation in your neck from a herniated disc spreads to the dura and the nerves that affect the dura up here. And that's why people get headaches from a herniated disc in the neck. The herniated disc causes pain through inflammation. Inflammation can spread around in the area where it is. It's not a pinpoint. It actually spreads out. The more inflammation, the more it spreads. Okay? You ever have a zit with inflammation? It's not just a tiny little red dot. It spreads. As a matter of fact, it can actually start spreading really wide. We call it cellulitis, where it can spread to a whole area of your body and keep going. If you've heard of flesh-eating bacteria, that causes a spreading inflammation. So the herniated disc, if it's a big tear and a lot of inflammation, it gets on your dura, it can spread up to your head, and it can actually cause headaches. Now that can trigger migraines. Migraines get triggers. So there are different triggers that trigger migraines. Sometimes it's wine, sometimes it's cheese or it's chocolate. Everybody's got different triggers. So one of the triggers for migraines could be pain in the neck causing the headaches. Okay. All right, what's the next question? I don't know, that's all. Have a great day. I hope you enjoyed the live stream and check out our app at Duke Spine Institute. We'll be live streaming again on Thursday. We have five surgeries and they're all laser surgeries. So get some popcorn and your soda, your favorite beverage and your lounge chair and get ready to be with us for the whole day of five surgeries. It's going to be a